Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, Green Lemon webinar, which um, is all very exciting. Just before I introduce our guest speaker, uh, just a quick note for everybody that if you if you pose questions in the Q and A panel, we try and get to as many questions as possible after the main uh, presentation. So on to our guest speaker for today, Daniel Hume. Uh, Daniel is an acknowledged leading expert and person of key influence in artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. And he's also the CEO of Satalia. Now, Satalia is an award-winning company that provides AI and products and solutions for companies uh, around the world of different sizes and scopes. Uh, his mission as CEO, self-declared, is to create a world where everyone is free to innovate and that those innovations become free for everyone. So a fabulous mission, which uh, I think everyone would condone. Um, in terms of his qualifications, Daniel holds a master and doctorate in AI at UCL and is UCL's computer science entrepreneur in residence. He is also a lecturer at uh, London School of Economics Marshall Institute, where they focus on using AI to solve business and social problems. Uh, Daniel is also a popular keynote speaker, specializing in AI, ethics, technology, innovation, uh, so decentralization, organizational design. He's a serial speaker for Google and TEDx and holds the International Kaufman Global Entrepreneur Scholarship, that's a mouthful, and is a faculty member of Singularity University. So in the spare time that Daniel's got, he's also a contributor to numerous books, podcasts, and articles around AI and the future of work. And he has advisory and executive positions across various companies and governments actively pursuing the purposeful entrepreneurship and technology innovation across the globe. So we're very, very grateful to Daniel for giving his time today to the Green Lemon Company webinar series. And what we seek through this series is to promote thought leadership and ethical implementation of intelligent automation. Uh, it's not a fact that doesn't escape anybody at the moment, but our digital lives are changing very rapidly and of course have been impacted by the pause effect of the COVID virus and we are particularly interested in Daniel's views on the relevance of this to the irreversible adoption of AI systems and its impact on life as we know it. So, Daniel, over to you. Uh, thank you. I think that's the best introduction I've ever had. I was just saying that half of it's made up, unfortunately, but uh, it makes me sound good. Uh, thank you so much for that. So I will, um, I'll probably share some slides, actually, uh, but before I do, just to let everybody know that... Um, I'll talk about three things. So we'll talk about artificial intelligence. And I know you can't open a newspaper nowadays without seeing the word AI. Uh, but today I'm going to try to de demystify and clarify what these technologies really are um, and uh, what they're capable of and what they're not capable of as, as well. Uh, try to, to, to address some of the hype. The second thing I'll talk about is how these technologies can be used to not just sell more stuff or to improve your um, uh, operations processes, but, but how they can be used to completely reinvent how an organization is structured. And then the, the third part of the talk, we'll talk about the end of the world, which is my, my favorite topic. Um, so my, uh, let me just see if I can share some slides here. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Uh, I've got host disabled participant screen sharing. So if I'm able to be turned into a host, that would be, that would be great. So uh, while, you're, while you're doing that, just, um, just to kind of emphasize on, on one part of my background, um, I have 20 years of experience in AI uh, at UCL, but I'm particularly interested in um, impact of technology. How do you take technology and turn it into something that has a positive impact on the world? And for the past four years, I've been running a master's program in um, applied AI, where I have uh, 100 students every year going out there applying emerging technologies to solving problems across a whole range of different industries. So I've got a very good sense about where organizations are at in terms of their digital transformation, their digital journey. So let me just share my screen. One second. Uh, okay. So hopefully you'll all see some slides. Let me just change that now. Um, okay, so you've heard about me, uh, uh, but so before we get into definitions of AI, I want to kind of get a grip of how intelligent this, this audience is, this group of people. So I'm going to try and uh, ask you some questions, and I, and I know that it's difficult to answer questions on a, on a Zoom, but um, I want you to try and answer these questions in your mind as we're going through them. I want to gauge how intelligent our, our audience is here. 
So I'm going to take you through this pyramid. And the first question that I want to ask everybody is what is data? So I'm sure that we've all heard the word data before. Some of us might even use data, but I want to ask you, what is data? What do you think data is? And uh, if you're feeling brave, you're also welcome to, um, to answer some of these questions in the, uh, in the chat as well. So, um, so data actually comes from the Latin word datum, which means given things, it's stuff, it's the fabric of our universe, it's ones and zeros, it's bits and bytes. It's not until you give something context does it become information. So often people think that data is information, but in, in computer science, they're two very different things. Data is the kind of the vibrations that are happening in the air, the, the vibrations that are hitting your ear, the light that's going into your eyes. We then have to take that um, data and then we have to interpret that and turn it into information. Um, so let me get you all warmed up. So um, what does this say again in your mind? Uh, hopefully many of you are saying ABC. Some of you might say A13C, but uh, if, you're, if I asked you what this says, hopefully you're all saying 12, 13, 14. But you can see that the data that's entering your eyes, the, the light that's going into your eyes is the same data, but you're giving it a different meaning based on its context. And I guess what we do as human beings is we take uh, this um, ambiguity, we take this ambiguous world and we use our statistical experience to, um, to, uh, to contextualize that, 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 that data. And if I, if I tweeted right now, my laptop is sick. So if I, if I tweeted my laptop is sick, I'm sure you're a really cool company. I think you're based in Brighton, I can't remember. So you all probably think that sick is, is awesome. Uh, but if you're old and boring like me, then sick means that it's broken. And so again, the context of the data um, is really important in terms of how you interpret it. And uh, again, if I asked you all to read this, um, this sentence um, and, and then picture in your mind what you think that this sentence is saying, Again, many of you might say, well, this is, could be read as John read, uh, read the letter to Mary. It could be an instruction, John read the letter to Mary, or it could be um, a scene where a guy is, is reading a letter to Mary. John read the letter to Mary. Um, but actually this can be interpreted in many, many different ways. So John could be reading a letter uh, that was sent to Mary, that was addressed to Mary. John could be reading the alphabet, A, B, C, D, D, uh, E to Mary. John could be reading the letter of the law to Mary. John could be reading a book titled The Letter to a Lady Called Mary. John could be reading a book titled The Letter to Mary. John could be reading two words on a piece of paper, The Letter to a Lady Called Mary. This can actually be interpreted in many, many different ways. And we will all go away with a picture in our mind of what we think is correct, uh, but we're probably wrong. And my goal today is to convince you all that humans are rubbish. That's my, my goal today. Uh, but what what we're doing is we, we, we're taking this data and we're using our statistical experience to try to then interpret this uh, this world and as it happens over the past 10 years we've now managed to get machines to do this pretty well we've managed to get machines to extract objects and images to to parse natural language so imagine if i give you a spreadsheet and in that spreadsheet it has three columns it has a column which is a date a column which is as, as a temperature on that date and a column which is the number of ice creams i sold on that date so date temperature ice cream sales it's information what do we do with that spreadsheet what's the first thing that we'll probably do with it well what we might do is maybe draw some graphs. We'll organize information, organize that information to try to find patterns. And if we plotted along the x-axis, uh, the um, increase in temperature and plot plotted along the y-axis increase in ice cream sales, then we'd see some sort of trend going upwards. The hotter it gets, the more ice creams we sell. And, and this is called descriptive analytics. What we're doing is we're organizing information to try to know things about the world. Uh, now we can do something really cool now. We can do a thing called predictive analytics where we can put a line through it this is what everybody's getting excited about at the moment so we can put a line through our, our our plot and now we have predictive power so if it's 22 degrees outside tomorrow i can look at my diagram i can see how many ice creams i'm predicting to sell and i can take this uh this model and i can put it into a machine and i can have that machine then um uh, manufacturing ice creams according to this this model uh, but it's very different to uh, uh, to know uh, to understand the difference between understanding and knowledge. So if I um, if uh, uh, I put this um, into a, a factory, then actually the domain experts going to say, Daniel, your model is dangerous or it's wrong because if tomorrow is the hottest day ever. Uh, then what will happen is that your um, your factory is going to manufacture lots and lots of ice creams. But in reality, 
um, maybe it's so hot that nobody's going to go outside. So you're not going to manufacture any ice creams at all. Um, so it's really important to bridge the people that, that can interpret this, um, this, these patterns with the people that are very good at finding the patterns. Because if you just looked at this line, there's no way that you'd be able to understand that when it's hot outside, that people go outside because we like the heat and then we can get too hot and then we can cool ourselves down in different ways. We can take our clothes off, we can go in the shade, we can buy an ice cream and we have to eat an ice cream to cool us down because of thermodynamics. There's no way that you'd be able to Ex, uh, to extract that knowledge, um, that information from this line. So it's really important to bridge the domain experts with the people that are good at finding patterns. Um, because what we're trying to do ultimately is we're trying to understand the world perfectly so we can make good decisions. Ultimately, that was what we're trying to do. And it turns out that decision making, this bit at the top of this pyramid, is in the realm of human beings. Typically, it's human beings making decisions. And I'm going to argue now that humans are terrible at making decisions and that we shouldn't be making decisions for the most part. So um, yeah, I'm sure that many of you have uh, read the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winning economist, and, and he argues that we have a fast brain and a slow brain. Um, so I'm going to ask you some maths questions now. And again, in your, uh, in your mind's eye, I want you to try and answer these maths questions as fast as possible, because if you don't answer them fast, then your competitors, they're going to they're gonna take your market. Um, so they're gonna, we're going to start out with really easy questions, and we're going to get more and more complicated. So the first question is, what is two times two? I hope that you all said four in your mind. Okay, so what is um, 14 times 763? I mean, I'd be very surprised if anybody can calculate that very quickly in your head. So the first one is an example of your fast brain. The second one is an example of where you need your slow brain to be able to figure out what the answer is. All right, let's, let's go again. We'll, we'll start out with a nice, nice and easy question and get more complicated. So, um, okay, the, co the combined price of a bat and a ball is one pound and 10 pence. The bat is one pound more than the ball. How much is the ball? Combined price is one pound and 10 pence. The bat is one pound more than the ball. How much is the ball? I'm assuming that many of you are thinking 10 pence. It's not 10 pence. And those of you that thought five pence, I think that you knew the answer already and you're cheating. But the, the bat is one pound and five pence. The ball is five pence. The combined price is one pound and 10 pence. The bat is one pound more than the ball. So this is a, a, an example of where our fast brain is making a decision, but we're wrong. And I can give you thousands of these examples of where actually we make decisions and actually they're wrong. So uh, let me ask you this. So imagine these are staff members. We all have staff members and we all have certain characteristics that we understand about those staff members. And one of the big challenges in organizations is to figure out how do we allocate these staff members to the right opportunities? How do we allocate them to projects? So maybe we've got five Pokemon here. Now I'm not gonna ask you to do this, but imagine we had to organize these Pokemon. We had to line them up in a way that satisfies some rules. So no same color, Pokemon are allowed to be next to each other. Flying Pokemon have got to be the right of walking Pokemon. Now, ignore the rules right now, but I wonder if anybody can tell me how many possible combinations there are of these five Pokemon. So I'm looking at one combination. I can flip two around, I get another combination. I can flip another two around, I get another combination. How many combinations are there of these five Pokemon? Those of you who remember your maths from school, uh, we'll, we'll know that it's 120. It's five times four times three times two times one. That exclamation mark we learned in school. There are 120 possible combinations of these five staff members and one will be the best one. And let, let's make the problem a bit more complicated. I've got 15 staff members now. And what I want to do is I want to allocate these staff members um, to the right projects. Can anybody tell me how many possible combinations there are of these 15 staff members? I wonder if, again, in your mind's eye, you know the answer to this. And don't say 15 factorial because that's cheating. Uh, but it's actually over a trillion possible combinations. There's 15 times 14 times 13, blah, 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 number of possible combinations of these 15 staff members. And to expect a human to solve this problem, to expect a human to allocate these people for the right opportunities is a waste of time. Anything more than seven don't use a human for. That's a good rule of thumb to take away, away with you today. Anything more than seven, don't use a human for. Um, and actually industry don't have problems of this size. They typically have problems of this size. So here I have 50, uh, 500 staff members. Um, just to give you some insight, the number of possible combinations looks like this. Um, it's a number that has over a thousand digits. And just to give you some context, the, the, once you start to reach about 60 things, 60 people or 60 resources to allocate, then you have more combinations than there are atoms in the, in, in the universe. 
So humans can solve problems up to about seven. We then probably could hire some good computer scientists that can solve problems up to about 30 or 40. Uh, but beyond that, you need to have deep, deep expertise in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a field of, of study that I'll talk more about in a, in a moment. But these are, are called optimization problems. They are resource allocation problems. And uh, let me just drum this home. Imagine I'm, um, I'm Tesco, which is one of our clients, and I'm delivering groceries to these, uh, these 24 points around these map, this map. Um, humans are actually quite good at solving these spatial problems. So maybe, you know, after a few minutes, we can draw a path around these points that save us the most amount of time and petrol. Um, how long will it, will it take a computer to get the shortest path? So we've got 24 points. How long will it take a computer to calculate the shortest path around these 24 points? It's not milliseconds, it's, it's uh, 20 billion years. So uh, we played this game already. If you put 24 times 23 times 22 da, 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 into a calculator, you get this num number of possible routes. And if you had a computer that would look at a million routes a second that could check one million routes every single second, it would take longer than the age of the universe, 20 billion years to go through every single possible one and say this one that I looked at 10 billion years ago, this one's the shortest one, you should do that. If I had another point in the map, I now have 25 times 20 billion years, so 5,000 billion years. If I had another point in the map, I have 26 times 5,000 billion years. These are exponential problems. Uh, and as I said, they exist in industry in thousands of different disguises, and humans are solving these problems very badly. So the reason why I talk about this is because everybody is excited at the moment about getting all their data together. They're getting all of their, um, they're going on their digital transformation, creating data lakes, which I think is a very bad idea. But anyway, uh, next thing that they're getting excited about is they're hiring data scientists, they're hiring machine learning experts, statisticians to try, try and find patterns from that data, trying to extract insights from that data. Um, but you can, you can extract lots and lots of insights from data using these technologies, but ultimately you are then relying on human beings to look at those insights and then make decisions from them. And as I said, human beings are typically terrible at making decisions. I would argue that companies don't really have machine learning problems. They have optimization problems. They have decision problems. Now, decision making and optimization is a set of skills that matured in academia about two decades ago. And then everybody got excited about this part, this, this stuff. But I suspect over the next five years, companies have been hiring loads and loads of these people. They've been investing in hiring statisticians, data scientists to solve problems that they don't understand. And actually they have these problems. And what's interesting is there's probably only about 3000 experts uh, in optimization around the globe. There are about 3000 people that are experts at solving these large scale optimization problems. So, but if you're lucky enough to build systems that bring all of these technologies together, you give it data, it goes through some machine learning module to extract some insights and then it makes a decision. And then tomorrow you give it the same data, it makes the same decision, you have automation. And automation is phenomenal because this can be done better than human beings and this at the top can certainly be done better than human beings. But the definition of stupidity is doing the same thing over again uh, and expecting a different answer. So whilst automation can bring a huge amount of value into your organization, by definition, it is stupid. And by definition, it is not AI. So um, everybody that touches this technology stack at the moment is calling themselves an AI company. And I know why, because we get more money from clients and we get more money from VCs, but this is not AI. There are, there are two definitions of AI. Um, the first one is popular, but I think is weak. So the first one is getting a computer to do things that humans can do. So, so over the past 10 years, we've now able to get machines to do things like recognize objects and images, correspond in natural language. We're able to do machines that traditionally only human beings could do. And because humans are the most intelligent thing we know in the universe, we then say that that's intelligence or that's artificial intelligence. Now, I would argue that humans can find patterns in about four dimensions and we can solve problems up to about seven. Computers can find patterns in thousands of dimensions and computers can solve problems with thousands of moving parts. Benchmarking machines against humans is a very, very silly thing to do. This is not the best definition of AI. There's actually a, a really elegant definition um, of AI that comes from the definition of intelligence. It's goal-directed adaptive behavior. Goal-directed in the sense you're trying to achieve an objective. You're trying to sell as many ice creams as possible. You're trying to allocate your staff to achieve some sort of utilization target. Uh, behavior is how quickly can I move towards that goal? How quickly can I allocate my resources to achieve my goal? But the key word for me in this definition is the word adaptive. 
ultimately what you want to do is build a system that can make decisions, learn about whether those decisions are good or bad, adapt their own understanding of the world so that tomorrow they can make better decisions. And if I was being brutally honest, I haven't seen a single successful adaptive system in production in my life. So I would actually argue that nobody is doing AI. Uh, so uh, now that's not to say that organizations aren't trying to um, aren't trying to uh, uh, go on this journey. But if you want to build adaptive systems in production, you have to make sure they're safe. You have to make sure they don't adapt in ways you can't predict. Uh, and if you say to an IT director, I'm going to put a system in production that's going to behave differently today than it will tomorrow. They say, no way is that going in production. I need to be really certain about how my systems are behaving. And if you say to an IT director, I need to put a system in production production that needs to make mistakes for it to get better, uh, then they say, no way am I putting a system in production that's making mistakes, even though automation is making mistakes all of the time. Automation is just not learning from those mistakes. The true paradigm of AI are systems that are able to adapt themselves in production. So there are two, there are two flavors of AI. Um, one is, uh, so AI in the 60s and 70s was called symbolic AI. So this is one of my favorite um, paintings. It's Socrates before he, he kills himself. Socrates is famous for inspiring the Socratic method. If, all men are, if, if uh, uh, Socrates is a man and all men are mortal, then I can infer that Socrates is mortal. And AI in the 60s and 70s was, was writing down lots of these rules and then trying to infer new, um, new knowledge from those rules. And it didn't really scale, it didn't really work. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, a new type of AI came along called sub-symbolic AI. It's often uh, called neural networks or now deep learning. Um, it's, on, it's based on how biological systems um, learn and uh, make decisions. And uh, this is the brain of a bumblebee. Bumblebees have a million neurons, a million brain cells. My, my PhD was, was originally trying to model the brain of a bumblebee. Uh, bumblebee brains can fit on the end of a needle, and, uh, but bumblebees can do amazing things. They experience the same optical illusions that we do. They can travel and operate in 3D uh, environments. They can solve problems. They talk to each other. They don't handle windows very well, but ultimately they're very, very smart little creatures. And the question was, could you model a million neurons in a machine 15 years ago when I was doing my PhD? And the answer is, is no. But about 11 years ago, there was a new paradigm in this technology that now allows us to build brains that have hundreds of millions of neurons. And we can now teach these brains to do things that only humans can do. And this is what people are currently calling AI, or deep, uh, deep learning. But I would argue that these technologies are fantastic at finding patterns in data. But then what you want to do is use these technologies to make decisions, to, to, um, uh, to um, perform logic on those different insights, to achieve some sort of ob objective. And then what you need to do is build a system that adapts itself in production. So this, for me, is not AI. This is advanced pattern recognition. AI is a paradigm of bringing together all of these different systems that, that are um, ultimately adaptive. Okay, so this is where it gets a bit weird. Um, over the past, uh, I guess, uh, if, if this um, semicircle is the bounds of human ability, I would argue that we can build systems, individual systems that, that solve um, problems, specific tasks that humans can do and significantly better than humans. So we can, we can build systems that now can do almost anything that a specific task that a human does. Um, but it's very inefficient to build individual systems to solve individual problems. So what we're ultimately trying to do are build systems that can do multiple tasks. And this is why humans are special. So we are one system that can do many things. So the question is, can we build one brain that can now do many things as opposed to one brain, one thing? This is called artificial general intelligence. And it's predicted if we take this uh, paradigm to its extreme, it's predicted that within our lifetime, we are going to build a brain that is smarter than us in every single possible way. We are, uh, this is the last invention that humanity will create. It's often referred to as the singularity or superintelligence. We have no idea if this is going to be the most glorious thing that happens to us or our biggest existential threat. Um, I believe it's our biggest existential threat, and, uh, and I'm trying to figure out how do we actually mitigate and solve this problem. Um, if you ask Elon Musk and some other people out there, they will say superintelligence has already happened and that we are actually living in a simulation created by a superintelligence in a different universe. It's called simulation theory. It 
keeps me awake at night, uh, but we don't have time to talk about it here, unfortunately. Um, before, before we build um, systems that are making decisions about our everyday lives, uh, so before we're building a super intelligence, we're having to build systems that, that, that uh, are making decisions about our everyday lives. This, I'm sure you've all seen before, is a trolley problem. I'm in my driverless car. In front of me is a kid. To the right are two adults, and to the left is a cliff. The car can't stop. Who does the car kill? And if you ask people this, there's no consensus on who to kill. Um, we, we, we have not agreed as a species what the right ethical decision is in this particular um, situation. But yet we are now having to build systems that are making these decisions. And I heard that one day we'll have an ethical setting in our car where we want to kill grandmas over cats or whatever. So ultimately it's our preference. Uh, and I heard that one day actually we will create a digital twin, an avatar of ourselves. And that avatar will be making decisions, not only who to kill, but what um, policies to, to vote on, which means that we actually might not need to have politicians anymore, which I think is a great idea. Um, but if I built a robot and, and I said, robot, your job is to maximize life expectancy. That's your objective um, and I had a burning building and in the burning building I had a crying baby and a suitcase with a billion dollars that the robot's going to go and save the billion dollars because it can now save more babies with that billion dollars than save the crying baby so we have to be very careful about when we build these systems what types of objectives we give them what types of constraints we give them as well and I'm sure you all know the answer to this but if I built a robot and said robot your job is to eradicate cancer the easiest way of eradicating cancer is to eradicate hu humans so again we have have to be very careful when building these systems. And this is a whole world of explainable AI, ethical um, algorithms that I, I could talk for hours about, uh, but this is going to become more and more important for us to ultimately build systems that are explainable. And I, just one thing to take away is that machine learning tends to be very, very difficult to explain, very difficult to understand what's going on, uh, but optimization is much more explainable. And I would argue that companies don't have machine learning problems, they have optimization problems. All right, let's switch now and talk about innovation. So actually, um, uh, for me, uh, in adaptability is synonymous with, um, with uh, um, intelligence. And ordinarily, most organizations look like this. They are a hierarchy that breeds certain type of relationships that I would argue are not very adaptive. They're not very agile. I'm sure you don't have any problems like this in, in your company, um, but um, I think that this model is broken. Uh, ultimately, what we're trying to do is figure out how do we engage, motivate our employees to build innovations to enable our organization to adapt to a changing world. If we are not adapting faster than our competitors, we are less intelligent and we are likely going to lose. And there's a very good definition for innovation that Steve Jobs had. He said, Innova innovation is creativity that ships. And the most important for me, uh, most important word in this definition for me is the word that. That is the, idea, the, the, the challenge of generating ideas and getting them to the point where somebody's willing to pay for them. That process is long and hard and painful. And the challenge is how do you shorten that process? Uh, because I would argue that over the next decade, this, this technology stack that I just described is going to be a commodity. We already have access to cheap compute and lots of data. All of the tools you need to build chatbots chat and million neuron brain machine learning tools, it's all free. It's all open source. You don't need to pay for it. And at some point, somebody will commoditize optimization. Somebody will commoditize self-learning. The, the battleground for companies is not technology, it's talent. How do you attract, motivate uh, talent to enable your organization to adapt to a changing world? Now, there was a really good book uh, by a guy called Dan Pink who said there are three things that motivate people, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Uh, autonom autonomy is giving people the freedom to do what they want, and mastery is giving them the ability to become really good at what they want. Purpose is giving them something higher to align themselves with. Um, and actually, there's a, there's a small P purpose, which is how do you link the things that you're doing every single day, the bug that you're fixing, the, you know, the, the whatever, the, the floor that you're sweeping, and how do you tie that to the big purpose of the organization? So your first challenge as a company is how do you attract talent in the first place? And I often ask my clients, how sexy is your brand or your industry and how interesting or challenging are your problem, uh, problems? If you're not sexy and you don't have interesting problems, you're not going to attract talent. If you're sexy and you've got interesting problems, you'll most likely attract talent and they will stay with you. Uh, and if you're in the other two quadrants, you'll attract talent and they will leave. They'll, they'll churn. And so it's really important to be honest with yourself, I think, where you are on this matrix, because that will determine whether you try and build out your own AI team, whether you work with third party vendors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because the number of CIOs, the number of people uh, that I've seen 
try to, you know, been given a lot of money to go and try and hire a, an AI team and they can't hire a single person because they're dis deficient in this matrix. But once you have attracted talent, whether that's a team yourself or you're working with third party vendors, you then need to create a culture that enables that talent to thrive. And, um, and over the past decade or two, we've seen a flattening of organizations. We've seen organizations removing middle managers, trying to operate in these thin or flat ways. And this is good. It's definitely better than these hierarchical systems. But I'm actually interested in, in creating an organization that operates without hierarchies. In, in Satalia, we have no managers, no KPIs, no hierarchies. Everybody's free to work where they want, how they want, on whatever they want. Um, and uh, we try to operate very much like a swarm, essentially tr create a completely new pattern paradigm for how organizations are structured. And my goal is not just to scale this to a thousand people or 10,000 people. My goal is to scale this to a planet. I want to try and create a planet where everybody is free to work on whatever they want, wherever they want, how they want, uh, to contribute to innovations and for those innovations ultimately to become free for everybody else. Um, and I'll try and give you a vision of how that might work. But before I do, just tell you a little bit more about how we work inside the company. So everybody's going on their digital transformation at the moment. They're all getting all of their data together, trying to, uh, to then figure out how to extract insights. The next thing that companies are trying to do is ultimately try and create a digital twin of themselves. They're trying to create a digital representation of all of their assets, the health of all of their assets, their machines, their equipment, even their people. We're seeing biometrics now being rolled out across organizations, capturing people's um, uh, uh, yeah, heart rate and all of that kind of stuff so that you can infer does this person get anxious in this particular scenario blah 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 uh, so we, we have a digital twin of satalia and, and with this i can see for example if one of these two people leave i'll have a silo in my organization interestingly you can identify people are going to leave the company before they know they're going to leave the company you can identify secret lovers in the company there's lots of really interesting ethical questions that you uh, have to raise when having this visibility in terms of people's skills their relationships across an organization um, but ultimately, companies are trying to get to this point where they can then ask questions and adapt that organization to a changing world. If this person leaves, will I have a problem? How do I address that problem before, um, before, I, um, before I experience it? So just to give you a few other examples, one interesting thing um, we do in Satalia uh, is that we try and decentralize decision making. So this is an example of where we ask people to publicly um, recommend their own salaries. So everybody would publicly declare what they want to be paid. And then everybody has the opportunity to vote on whether those salaries should be reduced or increased or kept the same. And we use machine learning to determine how many votes one person has for the other. So we look at your digital footprint and we'll determine whether you're knowledgeable about that particular domain, whether you've worked closely with that person, how knowledgeable you are about the company strategy, and then that will determine how many votes one person has for another. So, and what's interesting here is that it turns, so th th this little block here that you can see, these are everybody in my company. This blue dot here is one of our females. She made a recommendation for her salary. She had 429 votes to, votes to approve her salary, 36 votes to reduce, 280 votes to increase her salary. So out of everybody in the company, she had the most votes to increase her salary. She went away, she came back with a new number, uh, more, more votes to um, approve, zero votes to reduce, but still people were saying, you still need to increase your salary. You are still undervaluing yourself. So what this did is it, it allowed the crowd to identify a bias, in this case, the bias with, 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 with her, not being able to um, understand her own value, and the crowd solve that problem. And so we're trying to apply these types of decentralized decisions, not just to salary setting, but to feedback and all decisions that have to exist in an organization. How do you identify the right group of people that enables you to make the best possible decision? And very often that doesn't lie in the hierarchical structures that currently exist in companies. Okay. Uh, I'll talk more about that later on. So let's talk about the end of the world. So I think AI has been ha has had the, the the most hype out of any technology that I've ever been aware of. It's more hype than blockchain and big data and all this kind of stuff. And hopefully I've helped you all understand what AI is and what AI isn't. And that actually we're still very, very early in the journey of understanding how to apply AI. 
Now, that's not to say that AI isn't going to be in fact impactful. I actually think that AI is going to change our world in ways that we can't predict. And uh, it's probably going to have the biggest impact on humanity out of every um, technology that's ex existed before. And, and that goes to show in terms of the number of organizations, the number of governments that are investing in AI or what they think is AI. I think actually a huge amount of it is misunderstood and there's a huge amount of misinvestment. Um, but uh, I don't know if anybody knows who gave this quote up here. This quote, this quote is from the nation who leads in AI will be the rule of the world. This is uh, Vladimir Putin um, who, who said this uh, recently, I think it was to a group of children. But, uh, but the point is, is, that, is that those organizations that invest in these technologies are properly, who really understand how to apply these technologies are going to win. Uh, and just, just from my experience, there's less than 1% of organizations that really are investing properly in, in AI. Um, now, the problem with, uh, with this is that uh, winning has a particular connotation, which is let's maximize profits, let's maximize GDP. And the problem is, is that if we have this as our objective function, if we have GP maximize, GDP maximization, if we have profit maximization in, uh, as our, 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 our key objective for humanity, we are going to start to uh, treat people like a, 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 essentially a resource, a cog. And uh, so we can use these technologies to understand about your contributions, about your expertise, and we can use this technology to start to squeeze more and more out of our employees, more and more out of our customers. Uh, I'm sure that many of you have seen this, uh, this Netflix um, uh, um, series called Black Mirror. This is one particular episode from Black Mirror. Black Mirror is, uh, is a set, set of um, uh, short films, essentially, set in some sort of near-term dy dystopian future. In this particular episode, which is called Nosedive, um, everybody has an app, and we're, we're all scoring each other out of five based on our interaction. So I'll be scoring you uh, for not asking questions, and you'll be scoring me for talking too fast in this, uh, in this seminar. But, um, but ultimately, all of those scores culminate into one score. And that score carries around with you. you it unlocks faster internet, better hotel rooms. Uh, we know that this is being rolled out across China. And I think that because of COVID, we're going to start to see um, organizations rely on your digital footprint, rely on uh, these types of scoring mechanisms to understa understand how you are contributing in your organization. So um, uh, more and more people are now going to be working at home. We're not going to have managers. We're not going to have peers looking at us. So we have to get that data from somewhere. And I suspect it's going to come from our digital footprint. And if we then convert everybody into a score, we, I think that we're going to end up creating a dy dystopian future. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out how do we battle against this dystopian future? Um, sorry to point fingers at Facebook, they're an easy target, but Facebook's primary, primary job is to make money. That's their, their, their goal. And Facebook makes money by coming up with new innovations, by you know, connecting people, but ultimately by selling ads. That's what they do. And if Mark can't create his 5% returns to his shareholders every quarter by coming up with new innovations, what tends to happen in companies is they make decisions that compromise their users, compromise their employees, compromise the environment, they don't pay tax, even compromise other species. That's how we make our 5% returns. And if Mark doesn't make his 5% returns to his shareholders, he'll be replaced by another Mark that will. And my concern is this impulse to maximize shareholder return, this impulse to maximize profit, this objective function to increase GDP means that we are going to create an unsustainable future for our species. And AI and these technologies are just going to be able to accelerate this even more. We're going to see a consolidation of wealth and power in a small handful of organizations. And, uh, and this is uh, deeply worrying. Now, I actually think that if we can, t if we can build a platform that allows anybody to boot up an idea, anybody in the world to boot up an idea and then bring the resources together, the software developers, the accountants, the designers, the leaders, that bring those people together, that allow them to contribute to those ideas, to drive those ideas forwards without having a centralized company, we can then mitigate some of this risk. So I would envisage a world in the next 10, 15 years where we have an open version of Facebook. We have, a, we have an open source version that anybody can contribute to they're paid fairly for their contribution, but it's being driven by people who want to connect people as opposed to people being driven to make money for shareholders. And if it becomes weaponized, like, like Facebook and these social networks have, then you can switch it off without worrying about compromising shareholder value. 
And, and just to give you some of the economics, Facebook have now 3 billion users. If you charged each user 10 pence per year to access that flat platform, 10 pence per year, that's 300 million pounds to service a community of people to build an open source version of Facebook. Three, 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 300 million pounds. You don't have to have centralized companies to drive forwards things like Facebook, Airbnb, Uber. Uh, and actually I see that many companies might be replaced by decentralized companies over the next 15, 20 years. The challenge is how you bring all of the people together to work on a project without being centralized. And that's one of the problems that I'm trying to solve within Satalia. So just to close in the past few minutes, I don't want to be doom and gloom because I think that we're going to be okay, but there are three things that I'm concerned about. Uh, the, f the first thing I'm concerned about is what I refer to as the environmental singularity. So this was a study that was done in, I think it was Davos uh, or, or the World Economic Forum a few years ago, which is one of the biggest risks that we have to our, um, our um, companies. And the, the three of the biggest risks were environmental risks. And that has absolutely now happened because of COVID. Um, we have a, a massive impact on our organizations, on our economies, uh, but there are also lots of other environmental risks that I'm kind of lumping together. Um, that means that we might not end up having a, um, a uh, sustainable planet for our, for our species. So I think that this is one thing that we need to solve over the next 10, 15 years. The other two singularities that I'm concerned about, one is called the economic singularity, which is where there'll be a point in time where at the moment we're using AI and these technologies to free people up from their tasks, which is great because it means that they can go and do other things. They can work on other projects, et cetera, et cetera. But what, what this impulse to minimize costs and human labor is a large cost means that we'll be using AI to free people from their jobs. And I know that we will because we build solutions in my company to free people from their jobs. Now, we're not proud of it. We ultimately want people to be um, re-educated um, re, re, uh, and, and, and replaced back into the economy. But there is an impulse to, to replace people from jobs. And the economic singularity is where people are being freed up from their jobs. And they can't retrain fast enough to get new jobs because AIs are taking those new jobs. And I think that our economies are not ready for mass technological unemployment. And I think, again, in the next 15, 20 years, if we don't sort ourselves out, we could see a huge amount of social unrest because of job losses. The third uh, singularity I'm concerned about is the, called the technological singularity, which is where we build a brain smarter than us in every single possible way. This is the last invention that humanity will create. Um, and I think that if we are not cooperating as a species by the time this thing comes, if we're still fighting each other over resources, if we're still fighting each other over GDP, if we're still have huge amounts of bigotry and you know inequality, then I think that this thing will see us as a threat and it will remove us from the equation. So my challenge, not just to me, but to all of us, is how do we, over the next 30 years, figure out how to get humanity cooperating as a species so that we are not removed from the equation? And so um, I actually think that this solution is not going to come from governments. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not hopeful at all that the governments are going to create the right infrastructure to allow this type of um, solution to emerge. I actually think it's going to come from corporates. So I, I think that there's a, there's a massive need now to introduce and to emphasize purpose instead of profit. So, um, and I think that the companies that don't have a strong purpose are the ones that are going to die. So if you've got a strong purpose, you're gonna be able to attract employees so people are going to want to work with you because they want to be contributing positively to humanity. And also, you're going to attract customers because over the next several years, we're going to be more and more transparent about our consumption. And, uh, and if you are consuming from companies that are having a negative impact on the world, that will be called out and you will change your behavior. So I think that purpose is incredibly important. Um, so Talia's purpose, my company's purpose, is how do we enable a world that allows everybody to live beyond themselves? How do we create a world where people are born into this planet, their basic needs are met, they can access their healthcare, their education, their nutrition, it's all free, so that then they are free to live beyond themselves. Now, I'm not saying you have to live beyond yourself, you can do whatever you want, but let's at least give everybody an equal opportunity to, to positively contribute to humanity. That's my goal over the next 30 years, and I wanna work with more and more people to help us achieve that goal. So I'm going to close there and i guess open up to questions hopefully zoom hasn't dropped and i've just been talking to the ether for the past 40 minutes which has happened before <laughs> <laughs> no that's um that was absolutely fantastic daniel and certainly delivered a, a, a 
excruciatingly exciting place. So really thank <laughs> you for that. Um, we've got a whole bunch of questions. I'm just going to pick two or three and just put them to you. So we've got a very interesting question. Uh, what kind of test would a system have to pass to be considered true AI? So I guess it's sort of Turing test on steroids, right? So it's, it's a really good question. If we go back to our, um, the, the Turing test is, is, I think, I shouldn't say this, but I think Turing was maybe a little bit mistaken in this respect. I think we can now have machines that, that almost pass the Turing test that correspond in, in natural language. Um, but, but if we go to my second definition of AI, um, actually, if you just built, if you had your ice cream model and you had your, your linear regression, your line, and you had that line adapting itself in production. So tomorrow it predicted that it was going to sell 20 ice creams, but in reality it sold 30 ice creams and therefore the line adjusted itself. I actually would argue that that fits the goal adaptive, goal directed adaptive definition much more, much better than anything else. So, so I guess it depends on what your definition of AI is. Um, getting computers to behave like humans would be the Turing definition. But as I said, I think that we can get uh, machines to massively um, uh, outperform human beings at many, many tasks. But for me, actually, the true paradigm are building these adaptive systems, which is actually, I know I just said that this is, this is easy, but it's actually really, really, really difficult. Okay, thank you, Danny. That's great. Okay. And another question, um, how can we control the data held about ourselves that is used to train AI systems? Lovely question. And I think this is just, just to build on this question, there's a lot of misunderstanding about machine learning um, and, and bias. So th there's a misunderstanding that we, we build machine learning models and the, I guess the developer is prescribing their own biases. And in some cases that's true, but most biases come from not giving these machine learning models enough data or enough rich and rich enough data for it to be able to generalize. And if anybody ever said to you that, that machine learning isn't biased, they're either lying or they don't understand what machine learning is. All machine learning is essentially a biased. It's, it's a generalization of the world. Humans are biased. And um, so, so that, that's actually, go, to go back to the question, I'm actually hopeful about concepts like blockchain that will allow us to have um, data that isn't owned by any one organization, that isn't um, corruptible, but where uh, data is sensitive, I suspect we'll have trusted centralized organizations that are aggregating different data sources and protecting the, the, the sharing of that data. There's, there's also a, a, a project that Tim, Tim Berners-Lee is working on called Solidity, I think. I can't remember exactly the name of it. One second. I'll I'll, uh, I should know this because I just taught uh, an LSC lecture on it. So it, yeah, solid. So if you if you look at solid MIT, um, this is uh, this is actually an initiative that that Tim Berners Lee is working on about how to free people's data to make sure they understand how to audit where, where the data is being used for machine learning, blah, blah, blah. At the moment, centralized organizations have no incentive to make this, um, this uh, um, available to people. They've got no incentive to make it accessible, no incentive to really make it um, auditable. Um, we have to probably create um, uh, uh, policies and regulations to now start to hold these organizations accountable. But that there are initiatives that are underway to try to empower people to own their own, own data, to understand how their data is being used, and, uh, and yeah, and, and, and what, 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 yeah, what tools are being used to, 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 um, to, to yeah, using their data. So, so that's, that, that's a really good example. Look at Tim Burns' lead, Solid MIT. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, so thank you for that, Daniel. So um, a question I'm compelled to ask is when you talked earlier in your presentation about the exponential problems that we're, we're trying to get computing to solve, um, logically, to me, it, it seems that without quantum computing being part of the AI ecosystem, a lot of these problems will remain beyond the capability of classical computing. Lovely, lovely question. And so, there, so okay, so there's... A, there are, there are seven famous maths questions that have been asked by an institute in America called the Clay's Maths Institute. They, 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 they called the Millennium um, Problems. And there, there are seven. I think one has been solved by a Russian recluse. But one of them is called the P versus MP problem. And the question is, is there a fast way of solving these 
hard problems. P means polynomial, NP means non-deterministic polynomial. I won't go into the details, but nobody knows yet whether there is a fast way of answering, of solving these, um, these problems. And if you, by the way, if you do come up with a fast way of solving these problems, you then have changed our understanding of the universe. Not only have you won a million dollars, but you've probably won loads of Nobel Prizes and all this kind of stuff. But, but um, actually, um, over the past 50 years, computer scientists have done a huge amount of work in building algorithms that are really good at solving these problems. So yes, I was a little bit um, naughty by saying it would take 20 billion years, but in reality, we actually can build algorithms that solve these problems pretty well. Um, but but you, there are, as I said, there are only about 3,000 people on the, in, in, on the planet that are really good at understanding how to model these problems, understanding what are the right techniques, what are the right algorithmic um, yeah, uh, techniques to be able to actually solve these problems. So actually, a lot of these problems are actually solvable. So for example, Tesco have 100,000 points on a map that they're delivering to every single day. And we have milliseconds between each customer coming in to be able to optimize those vehicles. We don't have gazillions and gazillions of years. So algorithms are actually you know, being used to solve these problems. And, and likewise, if we go back to this example, PwC um, is, um, has um, uh, 5,000 auditors. They're PwC are one of our clients. They've got 5,000 people we need to allocate to products. Projects. So um, it, as long as you're, 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 you understand these optimization problems, there are, there are actually there's decades and decades worth of research in academia to solve them. Where I see organizations failing is where they hire loads of data scientists to solve optimization problems. There's a massive mistake, and that's because often um, senior leadership don't understand that they have optimization problems, nor do they understand the complexity of these optimization problems. And, and then also, obviously, there's a huge amount of hype around data, data scientists. So there's a big mismatch there. So, so in reality, um, so going back to your question about quantum computing, quantum computing won't actually solve these problems. Um, they, they will, they'll take the edge off solving these problems. They'll allow us to be able to solve these problems more efficiently. But I don't think that it's been proven that quantum computing will solve these problems um, polynomially, which, which means they won't solve these problems in a tractable time. Um, but, so, but they, they, will, they will certainly take the edge off. But actually, if you comp compare quantum computing now to a, a relatively vanilla algorithm, the vanilla algorithm will massively outperform the quantum computer. Okay, thanks, Simon. Um, very interesting question um, about feelings. So the question is, do you consider feelings to be data? Do you think there's a way for AI to develop what we call feelings and that would affect its decisions? You know, people always hate my answer to this, and, and this is probably my, me being a computer scientist. But f for me, human beings are a, are a biological robot. I don't think there's anything beyond our, our physical. Um, maybe people would disagree with that. So any anything that um, any information that our body is sensing that's being fed to our brains, whether that's sound or light or you know our gut, which is which is generating um, uh, chemicals that are then being interpreted by our, our brain. I think that ultimately we can. So I think that we f feelings is just for me another data input. Now, whether a computer can access that information right now is different. Whether a computer can pull in all of these different uh, uh, pieces of information and uh, even well, first of all access it and then um, assimilate it and then come to some sort of decision is a different question. H human beings are still you know, having coffee, uh, uh, conversations around their coffee machine. They're still looking at people in their eye to see how they're reacting. We have very, very finely tuned um, senses to uh, identify liars and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, now, uh, machines, if they had access to that data, they could probably um, outperform humans at being able to make those decisions. So I think ultimately the answer is yes, feelings are data. Uh, but the, the, the question is, can you actually get access to, to that data to allow your machines to make decisions based on those feelings? Okay. Thank you, Daniel. So um, this, might, this is going to be a tough one. So how can AI and machine learning cope with black swan events such as COVID to help companies as the historical data did not include or expect such outliers? Yeah, love, love this uh, question. So there are, there are two flavors of predictive, predictive problem. One is called, uh, I'm going to geek out a bit, one is called a first order chaotic problem, and the second is called a second order chaotic problem. So the first order chaotic problem is where you can take historic data, you can take three years of data, data and then you can build a model that can predict the future. That's called a first, first order chaotic problem. In reality, I think that we tend to deal with 
what are called second order Celtic problems. And COVID is a great example of that. So one of our clients is a large hotelier. And what they want to do is they want to predict demand into their hotel so that they can then price their hotel rooms to, to, to maximize their, their revenues. Now, it turns out that hotel um, uh, pe people that, that um, choose hotels are actually very price sensitive. So this is actually called a second order decadic problem, because if I changed, if I changed the, the, the pricing that, uh, compared to how it used to be, I'm going to change the behavior of people. So there's no way that I can predict demand anymore. So it is the same for the stock market. If I built a model that could predict the future on the stock market and then introduced my model to then buy and sell shares, that model didn't exist in the past. So my, all of my past data is now redundant. So what, what you typically have to do is treat these problems of, of what are called, uh, what are called second order credit problems, where you're looking at the, the changing world, you have a well-defined objective function, you, have, you understand the constraints, you're pulling in all of the different data that you can to then allow your system to adapt more quickly to a changing world. So I think that predicting things like black swan events, uh, assuming you've got the right data, you can probably predict them, but how to deal with them is by building adaptive models. So going back to this idea of genuine AI. Um, so, so, and actually, typically, you can do both. You can combine both um, historic data and local data to be able to make you do better decisions. Building adaptive models incredibly complex, and, and I think there's a massive now opportunity to bring adaptive um, uh, um, uh, um, predictions into this world of COVID because we just don't know what the future looks like. Thank you, Daniel. Now, quite obviously, you're not afraid of a bit of controversy. <laughs> so a question I have for you, um, when you were talking about the, you know, the sort of collaboration of the nations of the world and the governments of the world in, in the sort of effort to constrain the negative potential for AI, um, I think it's pretty fair to say that what we have demonstrated as a human community, especially over the last 30 years, is an, a complete inability to learn from the mistakes of the past. And I, don't, I personally don't think we're any better at collaborating trusting, uh, looking for the common good than we ever have been. Um, so to me, very typically, AI is, is, is going to head down the weaponization route rather than the peace, harmony, collaboration, good for all. Uh, how do you react to that? Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I am deeply concerned that that's the, the, the case too. And, and, if, and if I wasn't concerned about it, then I'd be doing something else, right? I'd be, well, I'd be like, this is a solved problem. We, it's going to be okay. But because I think it's not going to be okay, I feel compelled to try to solve these problems. And, and I think over the past decade, we've seen a centralization a nationalization, an attitude of closing borders of, um, because we want to try and control uh, and, and increase GDP. I, I actually think that, that blockchain, that decentralization is, is a reaction to that. But what's interesting is that companies don't have to exist within one country. A company can exist anywhere around the globe and you can tap into talent from anywhere around the globe. So I actually hope that companies will make it much more attractive for you to, to have your company in because they'll make the taxes better, they'll, they'll make the well-being of your employees better. And I would hope that companies, countries will then start to homogenize to trying to be nicer. <laughs> and that's a, that's a hope I have. And I've written a few articles that are set in 2045 that I'm very happy to share with this, with this audience. Um, but I think that decentralization by unlocking global talent, by enabling that talent um, to be able to innovate, to tap into that creative capacity of human beings, we, we, I hope that humanity will solve some of these problems. And the example that I often use is, you know, everybody says, well, this, this platform you're designing, Daniel, it's only really for the people that are able to do code and to be in a business, but it's not true. Uh, you know, you, you have platforms where you have Uber drivers and you have platforms where you have people that are operating using that system. An example I like to use is imagine you have um, old people in old people's homes that are just dying and bored. And then you've got people in another country that might want to learn skills or a particular language. Somebody could boot up a platform that connects these people together. They, then you, what you're doing, is you're, you're giving those old people meaning, you're giving them, you're solving that problem. And you're also uh, educating those people in other countries. We could tap into the creative capacity of humanity. And I'm sure that we'd be able to come up with loads of ideas that would help solve many of these problems that we're currently experiencing. Uh, but I, and, I, and I think that decentralization, blockchain, these ideas are gonna be the way of, of solving that. Okay, thank you, Daniel. And the last question, um, where do you see the line being drawn in how integrated AI is into our lives and planet 
have we crossed that line already? And is there any way to keep a control on how, how far this will go? Oh, it's a really tough question. Uh, maybe, maybe what I can do is um, I can share these two articles, the 2045 articles. My, my, my concern is that the AI, AI unfortunately is synonymous now with technology and, and, and really all AI does is remove frictions. How do we identify friction? and remove them using technology and if your objective is to maximize GDP if your objective is to maximize profit then AI is going to do that in spades uh, and then and I don't know where our place as human beings sit, sit within that if we have a different objective function which is to you know tap into the creative capacity of human beings to enable the survival of our, our species maximize opportunities to happiness blah 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 then again AI will facilitate that world I don't think that AI is going to going to go away I think what we need to do is we need to figure out what is our objective function um, as, a, as a species and how do we use these technologies to remove the friction to help us achieve our objective. Thank you Daniel. So we're exactly on the hour. Um, I'm pretty sure I'll speak for everyone listening that we, we could continue this for at least another hour and it would be thoroughly enjoyable and uh, yeah, yeah I, I can't thank you enough for joining the webinar today. Um, it's quite significant for us because we had a a big campaign of seminars as well stood out, but of course we've had to cancel all of those because of COVID. So I really appreciate you um, inaugurating our new webinar series. <laughs> it's been a, an absolute pleasure. Excellent. And I look forward to further discussions as we move forward. So thank you very much, Daniel Hume. Thank you to the audience for joining. Uh, thank you to my team for, at Green Labour Company for facilitating things. Great, thank thanks, you, everyone. Man. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Keep safe.